Hello, and thank you for joining today's acquisition seminar hosted by the Federal Acquisition Institute. Today's seminar, entitled Procurement Innovation Lab Primer, provides an introduction to the Procurement Innovation Lab at the Department of Homeland Security, how it's working to change the procurement culture in the agency, and how its work can help change the procurement culture in your agency. During this seminar, we'll explore techniques to improve the outcomes of your procurements, such as oral presentations, product demonstrations, confidence ratings, down selects, comparative evaluations, selecting best suited, then negotiating, on-the-spot consensus evaluations, and streamlined documentation. However, before we get to these, we need to flip the classroom. By that, I mean I need you to do a little work before you watch this presentation. You see, this is actually a condensed version of a one-day, all-day intensive workshop called a pill boot camp. Boot camps share techniques to improve procurement actions with contracting personnel, program managers, and procurement attorneys. Since a pill boot camp is impractical to reproduce here, you need to review the pill boot camp workbook associated with this presentation prior to watching it. Reviewing the workbook will help you get the most out of what you're going to see in here. Now, let's get started. Please give your attention to our guests, Trevor Wagner and John Inman of the Department of Homeland Security's Procurement Innovation Lab. Hi, I'm Trevor Wagner. And I'm John Inman. We're with the DHS Procurement Innovation Lab. The PIL set up by our Chief Procurement Officer at the Department of Homeland Security. We're a small team of GS-1102s with the mission of changing our procurement culture in DHS across all of our components so that our acquisitions can be faster while increasing the likelihood of our selecting the best contractors for the work. We do this by encouraging use of all the flexibilities that the Federal Acquisition Regulation gives us and dispelling the fears that our culture seems to perpetuate. For example, oral presentations have been allowed by the FAR for many years as an alternative to paper technical proposals, but we find that many in our acquisition community are afraid of oral presentations. We're afraid of accidentally crossing the line into discussions. But we know from our experience that that risk is very small and very manageable, and that the benefit in terms of speed and quality can far outweigh that small risk for many of our most important acquisitions. That's right, John. Another example is downselects. Think about it. Instead of receiving 30 complete offers and completely evaluating all 30 of them and doing a trade-off among all 30 of them, how about inviting all interested offers to submit a part of their proposal, such as experience or a concept for technical approach, evaluating those submissions from all 30 offers, and then down-selecting to four of them. And only those four provide the remainder of the proposal, such as the complete technical approach, management approach, and so forth, along with the price proposal. Then we can do a detailed evaluation on the four and a trade-off only amongst those four. This technique also saves both our time and industry's time while helping us select the best contractors for our work. We have many techniques such as these which procurement teams at DHS have tested through their actual acquisitions. These teams ask the PIL to consult with them to be their coaches so we know firsthand how well these techniques can work when executed correctly. And because we are trying to change our culture, we want to share these techniques with our entire Homeland Security acquisition community to socialize them to these ideas and to encourage their independent use of them whenever it makes sense. So we designed a one-day, all-day intensive workshop to share these techniques with contracting personnel, program managers, and procurement attorneys. We call it our PIL Boot Camp. We're here today to talk about the techniques we share in our boot camp. You can download the workbook from www.dhs.gov slash PIL, P-I-L. We recommend you pause this video and download the workbook now. We can't duplicate the boot camp experience here in this video, but our colleagues at the Office of Federal Procurement Policy and the Federal Acquisition Institute asked us to share what we're doing, and we're happy to do so. So instead of 20 or 30 minutes on each technique, we can only spend four or five minutes, so hang on, we're going to move quickly. But first, here is a word from Matthew Blum, 
Associate Administrator and the Office of Federal Procurement Policy. Hi everybody, I'm Matthew Blum, Associate Administrator for the Office of Federal Procurement Policy. My office is responsible for initiatives that help the workforce get the best value from its procurements. This includes creating a buying culture that embraces innovative acquisition practices. We think of innovation as a core value to a healthy acquisition system. In broad terms, innovative acquisition can include any practice that helps an agency create better results for the customer. During this video, you will hear members of DHS's Procurement Innovation Lab discuss a number of innovative acquisition strategies. In most cases, the strategy will be familiar, but offered with a fresh look that is designed to make the tool more impactful. The benefits of using innovative approaches can be significant. Just take a look at the PILS Yearbook of Results. I hope what you hear from our DHS peers inspires you to look for better ways of doing business. And I encourage you to share your innovative strategies with your colleagues and to give feedback to DHS at dhs.gov slash pill. Okay, let's start with our first technique, oral presentations. Let's say we want a technical proposal covering the offeror's capability, past performance, work plans or approaches, staffing resources, transition plans, or sample tasks. We could ask the offerors to present their technical proposal on paper, or we could ask them to present their technical proposals by oral presentation. That's right. Think about it. We really don't need technical proposals to be submitted on paper for most of our acquisitions. With an oral presentation, especially one that isn't prescripted by the offer, we can have a certainty that the information is coming from the offerer itself, from the company executives and key personnel in the room, rather than from a hired proposal writer. FAR 15.102 provides helpful guidance on oral presentations. Please pause this video so you can read this text for yourself. As you can see, paragraph A tells us that oral presentations may substitute for written information and that oral presentations provide an opportunity for dialogue among the parties. If you're afraid of oral presentations, it is probably because of that word, dialogue. But you don't need to be afraid of dialogue. After all, it's right in the FAR that dialogue is a part of oral presentations. And the FAR goes a step further. It speaks of interactive dialogue. That's right, Trevor. Sometimes we do oral presentations as monologues, where the offeror speaks and the government listens and takes notes. But we can do dialogues, even interactive dialogues, at oral presentations. And if our purpose is to help us select the very best contractor for the work, shouldn't we want to talk with offerors as part of the selection process? When we coach our procurement teams, we share that there are two broad types of questions we can ask at oral presentations. First, standard questions that we ask of every offeror, and second, individualized questions that arise in only one offeror's oral presentation. Let's start with the standard questions. Here are three ways to present standard questions, and we can use one, some, or all of these approaches. First, we can list the questions in the solicitation or otherwise provide them to offerors a few days or a week before the offeror's scheduled oral presentation. This allows an offeror to carefully consider the questions and to pre-script and rehearse its answers. Second, when the offeror shows up for its oral presentation, we give the team a list of questions and ask that they answer those questions. We can allow them a half hour or an hour to review those questions before the oral presentation begins. And third, we can interrupt an oral presentation already in progress and ask a standard question or two. Now for the individualized questions. We can ask individualized questions on the spot during an oral presentation, based on information shared by the offeror during their oral presentation. These questions are not meant to challenge the offeror's approach or to get the offer to change its approach, but to make sure that we fully understand the offeror's proposed approach or solution. We can ask these questions during the presentation, or hold them all until the end. And this is where we start addressing the fear factor, the fear of accidentally crossing the line into discussions. Our experience shows us that this fear is greatly exaggerated. 
We've had multiple post-award protests from unsuccessful offerers on our pill acquisitions alleging that the exchanges at the oral presentations where we ask individualized questions constituted discussions. The GAO supported us and denied the protest every time. Here is the pertinent text extracted from one of these decisions. That's a powerful decision. Just look at the keywords. Exchange occurred entirely within the confines of the three-hour oral presentation session. Nothing said during the exchange revised any aspect of the firm's previously submitted proposal. The offer was not permitted to submit anything further to the agency. Not afforded an opportunity to revise anything that was said during the oral presentation or any of the firm's previously submitted proposal. We do not consider the exchange to have been discussions. Rather, we review it simply as a component of the oral presentation itself. Another fear of oral presentations is that without a paper proposal, the government cannot defend an argument that an offerer did or did not adequately cover some material in an oral presentation. Our experience shows us that this fear is also greatly exaggerated. We had a GAO post-award protest on exactly that issue. The GAO supported us and denied the protest. Again, let's look at the GAO's own words. Let's look at the key words in this decision. According to Lidos, the protester, DHS misunderstood its approach. Lidos contends that its oral presentation fully addressed and provided details. To the extent the agency misunderstood Lidos' approach, the responsibility for providing a thorough, persuasive response to agency questions as part of an oral presentation falls on the offeror. So the fears that seem to stop us from doing oral presentations don't hold up very well, do they? No, they don't. There are risks, but those risks are small and entirely manageable. We do not want that inch of risk stopping us from getting a foot of benefits that can come from an oral presentation. Let's manage the risk, not avoid the risk, and when it makes sense, let's do oral presentations instead of paper technical proposals. Another question that comes up is if the government is required to record the oral presentation. The short answer is no. We have to have a record, R-E-C-O-R-D, but the record doesn't have to be a recording. The FAR gives us several examples of possible ways to create that record, such as a video or audio recording, the offer's presentation slides, government notes, or even the consensus evaluation report. This is the contracting officer's decision. We've done 45-minute to all-day oral presentations and everything in between. We've done acquisitions where part of the technical proposal was submitted on paper and part by oral presentations. You just want to ensure that you reduce paper submissions, not duplicate paper submissions, by use of an oral presentation. Get the information you need to evaluate one way or the other, not both. Knowing this, we've also had teams that conducted acquisitions where the entire technical proposal was submitted by oral presentation. If you're planning an oral presentation, you have to make it fit your acquisition. Your procurement team, contracting officer, program manager, and attorney need to talk about it and make it fit. The reduction in paper really does make the evaluation and review processes much faster, and the interactive dialogue gives us much greater confidence that we are selecting the best contractor for the work. Now let's shift to our second technique, product or technical demonstrations. A product or technical demonstration is a variant of an oral presentation, but instead of simply words or explanations on a whiteboard, the offer will actually show us something, and maybe we'll even get to touch and feel the product. The same fears that are associated with oral presentations are also in play here, but similarly, they are greatly exaggerated. The benefits of a product or technical demonstration can far outweigh any small risks. In our all-day boot camp, we give real examples of teams that use these techniques. A team at Customs and Border Protection bought density meters using a product demonstration. A density meter works like a stud finder and can detect anomalies in mass and can find contraband in hidden spaces and so forth. Think drugs and a car tire. Rather than a paper technical proposal, the solicitation invited offerers to bring in their products, show us how to use them, do some tests while the offer was still in there, and leave them in our possession for a couple of days for more detailed government-only testing. 
The government used broad evaluation factors such as feasibility of use, support of the mission, and so forth. And those broad evaluation factors in a product demonstration setting allowed the team to learn far more than it could have with a paper technical proposal. For example, the team learned that some products were a little on the large side and might not be able to be used by the entire workforce with one hand. Some products work well with right-handed use, but not so well with left-handed use. The team brought in Border Patrol agents to participate in the testing, and they provided insights that the suits in D.C. could not have imagined. When we're buying existing products, product demonstrations almost always make sense, but they can make sense for other acquisitions as well. For example, if the contract will require the new design and fielding of a complete system, maybe we can ask for a demonstration of the first increment of the system or some other functionality or interface. Just as for oral presentations, you have to make a product or tech demo fit your acquisition. Again, make sure the product or tech demo doesn't duplicate what you get in a written submission, but rather replaces those written submissions. Your procurement team, contracting officer, program manager, and procurement attorney need to talk about it and make it fit. The reduction in paper really does make the evaluation and review processes much faster, and the interactive dialogue, along with the opportunity to touch and see, gives us much greater confidence that we are selecting the best contractor for the work. Okay, moving right along. Technique three, confidence ratings. For most of our acquisitions, we want to be able to select an offeror that provides the best value and who will actually perform and deliver. Our selection process should provide us with confidence in the winner. We want to make our acquisitions faster and for us to select the very best contractors for the work. We found that the traditional adjectival rating system with five tiers and ratings dependent on the number of strengths and weaknesses was slowing us down in our evaluation processes and afterwards in our review processes. We wondered if we could make this process work better. We don't want an adjectival rating approach that ties our hands and takes away our subjectivity. We want to give the highest ratings to the best offers as a matter of first impression without first having to count the strengths and weaknesses and then have the rating being a function of that counting exercise. So instead of counting strengths and weaknesses before assigning a rating, we look at the offer's holistic approach and focus on our confidence. Now, let's ask our audience a question. How many of you have been involved in an acquisition where the evaluation was finished three weeks ago and the technical evaluation team has gone back to their day jobs and yet here we are, three weeks later, still arguing about the ratings and rewriting the evaluation team's report? And since our real goal is selecting the best contractor for the work, the contractor who will actually provide the best value post-award, shouldn't we actually evaluate what we're looking for and evaluate our confidence that the offeror understands the requirement, proposes a sound approach, and will successfully perform the contract work? Put all of this together and you have a different adjectival rating scheme, confidence ratings. Three tiers instead of five, so it's simpler, and we can assign ratings in immediate consensus as a matter of evaluation team professional judgment without having the rating being driven by counting strengths and weaknesses. It's a very flexible approach. Remember that nothing we share is mandatory. If we share a technique that you like and it fits your acquisition, feel free to adopt it and use it. If we share a technique that you don't like and it doesn't fit, then don't use it. That's what we tell our teams when we coach. The CO, the procurement team, they make the decisions. We strongly feel that procurement innovation works best when it is voluntary. Many Homeland Security acquisition teams have used this technique and they really like it. It can make your process faster. Let us show you how. This technique works with either paper proposals or oral presentations. This technique works in any part of the FAR including open market, schedule orders, fair opportunities, or simplified procurements. Now imagine that you have just finished reading a paper proposal and you made a few notes in the margins of the proposal. Or imagine you have just watched a video or oral presentation and you made a few notes on a notepad. You gather with the other evaluators in consensus to arrive at the consensus rating. The team chair or contracting officer asks everyone for their rating on a given factor and all three evaluators say high confidence. Well, guess what? You have assigned the rating, and it took about 10 seconds to do it. 
Now you document, preferably using short bulleted statements, appropriate support for that rating, and you are done with evaluating that offer for that factor. Or perhaps as you gather with other evaluators in consensus to arrive at the consensus rating and the team chair or contracting officer asks everyone for their rating, two evaluators say some confidence and one says high confidence. Okay, so now you have a discussion and you come to consensus. Maybe some confidence, maybe high confidence. But instead of 10 seconds, maybe it takes 10 minutes and you are now in consensus. You document, preferably using short, bulletized statements, support for the rating, and you are done with evaluating that offeror for that factor. This approach might seem backwards to some of you, rating first and rationale second, but it does make sense and it is so much cleaner and faster. Rather than documenting everything that every evaluator observed, and talking for hours about those observations and then trying to come to a consensus rating, it is easier simply to agree on the confidence rating and then to document the rationale for that consensus rating. Some agencies mandate the rating scheme that evaluation teams must use, and some leave it up to contracting officer discretion. If you're in an agency where you have some discretion, we invite you to consider simplifying your evaluation and rating approach with confidence ratings. Confidence ratings are legal. The GAO has seen them many times. Trevor, we have heard some of our Homeland Security colleagues that they are uncomfortable with confidence ratings because they are subjective. Well, of course they're subjective. Even the five-tier traditional adjectival rating system is subjective, but subjectivity is okay. Nothing in the FAR requires objective assessments of offer technical proposals. If you can objectively measure performance outcomes like speed, distance, weight, and so forth, that's fine. But for most of our acquisitions, especially for our service acquisitions, it is all subjective, and subjective evaluations are okay. That's right. The GAO has repeatedly told us that the professional and subjective judgment of evaluators are fine as a basis for our evaluation findings. And the GAO has repeatedly told us that it will not substitute its own subjective opinion for the opinion of the evaluators or selecting official. Confidence ratings may not fit for every acquisition, but if you think it will make your next acquisition a little faster, try it. In some of our Homeland Security acquisitions, we might receive 30 or 50 or even over 100 offers. That could mean many, many offers incurring significant bid and proposal expenses. And it also could mean that we have to do a detailed and complete evaluation of all of those offers. And our trade-off has to cover every single offer. But there is a technique that can help make this more manageable and more efficient for both us and for the contractors. This is technique four, down selects. Think about it. Instead of making all prospective contractors, let's say 30, prepare complete technical and price proposals, and then the government doing a complete evaluation of all 30 and a trade-off among all 30, how about inviting all interested firms to submit a part of their proposal, such as experience or concept for technical approach, evaluating those submissions from all 30 offers, and then down-selecting to four of them. And only those four have to provide the remainder of the proposal such as the complete technical approach, management approach, and so forth, along with the complete price proposal. Then we can do a detailed evaluation on the four instead of the 30, maybe even with an oral presentation or product demonstration, and a trade-off among those four instead of the 30. We have seen this technique save time and helps us select the best contractors for our work. This is a very powerful technique. And just to make sure, please understand that we're talking about a down select, not forming a competitive range. We form a competitive range after we have evaluated offers and in preparation for discussions. But here, we're talking about a down select to phase the offeror's proposal submission and the government's evaluation. We evaluate all offers on a few evaluation factors in the first phase, and only the successful offers from that first phase have to submit the remainder of their proposal for our evaluation. We tell the unsuccessful offerors that there is little to no likelihood of their proposals being selected for award. And by making the final pool of offers smaller, we are able to dig more deeply in our evaluations, to do our due diligence to make sure we are selecting the best contractors for our work. 
The key to a down select is deciding which evaluation factor, one or just a few, to use in the first phase. Generally, we recommend that the first phase evaluation factors should be relatively light so that prospective offers can submit quickly and so that we can decide quickly. We have found that prior experience is an excellent first phase evaluation factor. Is the offer already in the business? Has it already mastered the learning curve? Does it already have the right people, facilities, and so forth? Some acquisitions use only prior experience as the only factor in phase one. Other acquisitions might add another factor, such as general concepts or an approach. As always, the evaluation factors have to be crafted to fit the acquisition. This is what a timeline might look like. If we have released a draft solicitation, and if the first phase factors are relatively light, maybe we can ask for the first phase proposal to be submitted 10 days after solicitation release. Then, maybe it takes us 10 days to evaluate them and send notices to offerors. We might ask for the proposal for the next phase factors to be submitted in three weeks or 30 days, some reasonable period of time. Or we might schedule oral presentations with this smaller set of offerors. Remember technique one, oral presentations? Maybe we don't need a written technical proposal, but the technical proposal can be delivered by oral presentation. Good point, John. Many of these techniques can be used with other techniques for very powerful results. In our practice, we describe two types of down selects, firm and advisory. Let's talk firm first. Okay, firm down selects. In a firm down select, the government selects the offerors who will proceed to the next phase in a firm manner, like an umpire at a baseball game. You're out. There's a time and place for this technique. It doesn't fit every acquisition, so you need to think carefully before using a firm down select. In a firm down select, we are excluding the unsuccessful offerer from the remainder of the competition, and the general rule is that an offerer has protest rights when the government excludes it from the competition. So you have to decide if you can bear the protest risk. If you can, or if protests are not allowed, such as fair opportunity considerations under multiple award contracts under $10 million for civilian agencies or $25 million for defense, then a firm down select is the way to go. Now the other approach is the advisory down select. In an advisory down select, the government selects the offerers who will or will not proceed to the next phase in an advisory manner. In the advisory down selects, the first phase evaluation factors are the most important so that offerors understand that they have little to no chance of receiving an award if they are not among the most highly rated out of the first phase. For these offers that we don't recommend proceeding to the next phase, we tell them that. That, based on the first phase evaluation factors, their proposals have little to no chance of being selected for award, and we advise them not to participate in the next phase. But we leave it up to them. Almost always, offerors will accept our advice and walk away. Only in one instance out of a few hundred notices where we told an offer that has little to no chance of being selected for award has an offer decided to participate in the next phase. What happened there, John? That team only allowed three days in between phase one and phase two. So the offerer already had its phase two proposal completed. It is customary and reasonable to allow two, three, or four weeks to prepare the complete technical and price proposals you do need to build that time into your milestones, but you will find that this ends up saving time downstream. Remember, we're only advising that they have little to no chance of being selected for award and recommending they they not participate in the next phase. We're not excluding them from competition. And since we're not excluding them, there is no protest right and there is no debriefing right. If you're thinking about doing a down select in your next acquisition, we generally recommend doing the advisory down select as Trevor described. It is advisory and may cause less concern in your review chains than a firm down select will. Your market research should give you an idea of how many offers you will receive. If you know you are going to get a lot of offers, think about a down select to minimize the bid and proposal costs on industry and to allow us more deeply, more carefully evaluating the complete proposals from fewer offers. After all, how many offers do we need to have in the running at the very end to select the best value? For one award? 
maybe two or three or four in the final running is best. Or if you intend to make five awards, maybe it's eight or ten. You decide for your acquisition. You might include text in your solicitation that the government intends to invite up to four offers into the next phase. We have talked about a down select between two phases, but you could also do a three phase acquisitions. We've done both two and three phase acquisitions in DHS. And we've seen down selects where or presentations were done in the first phase and where they were done in a subsequent phase. You have to decide what fits your acquisition. For example, if you anticipate 30 offers, it might be best to do oral presentations in the second phase after you have called through the crowd down to four offers. Or if you anticipate only eight offers, you might do oral presentations in the first phase to help you make a down select to four. The key is that you have to decide for yourself and your acquisition, firm or advisory, your call, two phases or three, your call, which factors in which phase, your call, oral presentations or paper, your call. We have talked about this down select approach with industry. It seems that unanimously industry supports this technique. No one likes to lose, but if a company is going to lose, it prefers to get the information sooner rather than later. Down selects can be a win-win, better for industry and better for us. We're moving right along. Remember, in this video, we are only giving you a very brief overview of these techniques. And when we do webinars for the DHS acquisition community, we'll do an hour and a half on a single technique. So yes, we're moving very fast, but we hope you can see that these techniques really can help make our acquisitions faster and increase our confidence in selecting the best contractor for the work. You may want to look more closely at the Pill Bootcamp workbook or even actual sample solicitations that have utilized these techniques to learn more. The four techniques we have already discussed may be used for all four of our standard acquisition methods. Simplified acquisitions, source selections, ordering against scheduled contracts, and ordering against multiple award IDIQ contracts. But technique five, comparative evaluation, really doesn't fit for source selections, so we recommend it only for simplified acquisitions, ordering against scheduled contracts, and ordering against multiple award IDIQ contracts. Remember in Technique 3, Confidence Ratings, we talked about using a three-tier adjectival rating system instead of the five-tier traditional system. Now, let's talk about using no ratings at all. If we don't even assign adjectival ratings, then we won't lose any time in the review process for justifying, defending, and rewriting those ratings. We've all heard that we're not supposed to compare offers to each other. That's true for a source selection under FAR subpart 15.3, but for this technique, we're not talking about source selections. We're talking about simplified acquisitions, ordering against scheduled contracts, and ordering against multiple award IDIQ contracts. That's right. This technique works best when we have a few non-price evaluation factors and a few offerors, like maybe up to five factors and up to five quotes or offerors, but there's no hard number. To walk through one way to approach this technique, let's look at a notional technical evaluation report template. For this sample, you see that we have three non-price evaluation factors, numbered one, two, and three, and you can see that we have three quoters, A, B, and C. You may press pause if you want to look at this template more closely. This is just a template. Using this template, the evaluator or evaluation team will start with factor one and write its observations, good and bad, for quote A with a few bullet points. Then it would do the same for quotes B and C. No adjectival ratings are assigned, just the observations that are pertinent for that factor. Then the evaluation team compares all three quotes for factor one and identifies the quote that is the most advantageous to the government and explains why. In this sample, Let's say that quote A is most advantageous. Then the team does the same thing for factors two and three. In this sample, let's just say that quote B is most advantageous for factor two and quote A for factor three. And that's it, the technical evaluation report is done. So the technical evaluation report goes to the selecting official who will do the trade-off to select the best value to the government. Here is a notional template for a trade-off decision document using the sample Trevor just described. Look at the table towards the top of the document. 
Here you can see the three non-price factors numbered one, two, and three with the addition of price as factor four. You can also see the three quotes A, B, and C. The check marks identify which quote is most advantageous for each factor. You can see that quote A is most advantageous for factors one and three, and quote B is most advantageous for factor two, as Trevor explained in the sample, and quote C is most advantageous for factor four. The selecting official reads a technical evaluation report and also sees the prices, and he or she makes a trade-off decision. There are three possible decisions that could be made, and this template shows, in simple terms, a format for any of those three possible decisions. Quote A could be selected as the best value if the selecting official agrees with the evaluation team's assessment and decides that the technical merit of quote A for factors one and three justifies paying the price premium associated with quote A. Quote B could be selected as the best value if the selecting official decides that the technical merit for quote B for factor two provides more value than factors one and three and he or she is not willing to pay the price premium for quote A. And quote C could also be selected. It isn't the most advantageous for any of the non-price factors, but it could still be entirely acceptable. And if so, and if the selecting official doesn't see all that much technical merit in the other quotes or isn't willing to pay the price premium for quote A or quote B, then quote C is the winner. This becomes the trade-off decision document and you're done. This technique can be very powerful and very fast. We don't get hung up on assigning and defending adjectival ratings. We've seen this technique used for many schedule orders for many millions of dollars. For example, a DHS team used this approach to award a $53 million task order in just 42 days from release of the RFQ to the award. There are other ways to do comparative evaluation. We shared one way. If a Homeland Security Acquisition Team wants to use this technique and they'd like the pill to support their procurement, we will help them figure out the best approach to fit their acquisition. Now for technique six, select best suited then negotiate. Like the last technique, Technique 6 doesn't really fit for FAR subpart 15.3 source selections, but it does fit for simplified acquisitions, ordering against scheduled contracts, and ordering against multiple award IDIQ contracts. You have to be careful using this technique. You still want to make sure your procurement attorney is supportive. There is risk associated with this technique, but we still want to share it with you you have to make the decision. We share it because we want to fully understand the flexibilities that the FAR already gives us, and we want to be ready to use any tool in the toolbox, so to speak, to best meet whatever acquisition comes our way. First, remember that the structured approach of exchanges with offers that is described in FAR 15.3 only applies to source selections. And we're not talking about source selections for this technique, we're talking about the simplified acquisitions, the schedule orders, and the orders against multiple award IDIQ contracts. The procedures of FAR 15.3 don't apply outside of 15.3. Instead, the standard that applies is simply one of fairness. As long as we treat offers or quoters fairly, we have great discretion on the processes we use when describing those evaluation factors outside of 15.3. Let's start with some sample text from a solicitation. Here is the real text that was used in a real acquisition of Homeland Security called HART. Please press pause if you need some time to read the text. HART was a fair opportunity consideration for an order against multiple award IDIQ contracts, about $107 million. The contracting officer put text in the solicitation saying that the government could select the apparently successful offer and then hold exchanges with only that offeror to finalize all the details, including technical and price. And that's what happened. The government selected the apparently successful offer and then held exchanges with only that offer. After the debriefing, an unsuccessful offer protested to the GAO. Here's the pertinent text from the GAO decision. As you can see, the text was in the solicitation, and the government did what the solicitation said it could do. Everything was fair. The key is that FAR 15.3 procedures do not apply to fair opportunity considerations for an order against multiple award IDIQ contracts. 
so there is no need to form a competitive range, set a common cutoff for proposal revisions, and so forth. The only requirements are that we follow our own solicitations, which we write, and that we treat offers fairly. The principle of fairness is important here. Let me share an example of when this technique might fit. We recommend including the text similar to the Hart solicitation in all solicitations for simplified acquisitions, orders against scheduled contracts, and orders against multiple award IDIQ contracts. You won't know whether you will use this technique until after you have evaluated your quotes or offers. So including the text in your solicitation saying that you may is very important. So let's say you did, and let's say you have three quotes. Clearly, in this example, quote A is the apparently successful offeror. Hands down, quote A is the best value. But maybe, let's suppose quote A's price of 901000 is just a little higher than the purchase request amount of 900000 With language similar to Hart in the solicitation, I can call quote A and ask if it can drop its price by $1,000 without changing anything else. If quote A says yes, I award quote A for $900,000. Have I been unfair to the other quoters? No, everything was fair. Quote A is the best value. I just made the best value even better. I agree, John. But what if quote A says no, or says that it will have to change its technical approach to make that price reduction? That's not a problem, Trevor. I still have all sorts of tools in my toolbox. I could go back and get a purchase request amendment to add $1,000. Or I could open price negotiations with all three, or maybe even just two. Or I could do a solicitation amendment to lower the technical requirement and ask for updated quotes. I could do any of these things if quoter says no. But if the quoter says yes, I can make the award, and no one has been treated unfairly. I simply made the best quote even better. Let me offer another example. Let's look at another acquisition. Here, we fairly evaluated based on the evaluation factors, and quote B is the best value. Again, it is clear to see. But let's say that quote B included an assumption in its proposal, and that the assumption is problematic for us. We aren't in 15.3, so I call quote B, and I ask if it can drop its assumption. What are the possible answers? Quote B could say yes, or they could say no. Or they could say, we can, but will affect some other aspect of our proposal. Well, we can deal with any of those answers. If quote B says yes, it can drop the assumption without changing anything else, then we award to quote B. No one else has been treated unfairly, the best quote was just made better. If quote B says no, or says we can, but it will affect some other aspect of our proposal, then the ball is back in our court. We can open negotiations with two or three quoters. We can do a solicitation amendment to address the assumption and get revised proposals. But if quote B says yes, we award and we're done. Again, fairness is an important principle. We have to treat the quoters fairly. The government has the leverage during the negotiation here as the award has not yet been made. Too often we come to the kickoff meeting and we already have modification one prepared to address one of these scenarios. We lose that leverage when the award has already been finalized. I hope you're all staying with us. We're moving quickly, I know. We hope you will use our Pill Bootcamp workbook as a reference if you have additional questions. Now, for Technique 7, on-the-spot consensus evaluations. Let me start with a question. When we have an evaluation team, is it necessary for each evaluator to produce his or her own evaluation report before the team assembles to arrive at consensus? The answer, no. Nothing in the FAR requires individual evaluator reports before assembling for consensus. It might be customary and it might be written into your organization's rules, but nothing in the FAR requires it. The FAR and the case law that has been developed around it ask for the evaluation team to share only its consensus evaluation findings with the selecting official. We advise our teams to skip individual evaluator reports and to go straight to consensus. For paper proposals, you can tell the evaluators to read Offer A early in the morning, to make notes in the margins, and to assemble at 11 o'clock for consensus of Offer A, and then to read Offer B in the early afternoon, and to assemble at 3 o'clock for consensus for Offer B, and so on and so forth. 
or for oral presentations, the evaluation team stays in the room after the offeror departs and does the consensus evaluation right then and right there. Sometimes an evaluation team will work better if there is a facilitator to help keep them on track, such as a contracting officer. I have facilitated a number of times. I'm not an evaluator and I don't pretend to be one, but I can help speed the process and help ensure a quality product by acting as a facilitator. And sometimes I'll use a contract specialist as a note taker with a yellow legal pad. A facilitator and a note taker are not required, but sometimes can be helpful. By going straight to consensus and skipping individual evaluator reports, we really can make acquisitions faster and produce higher quality evaluation reports. We recommend working backwards in a way. When a team gathers for an on-the-spot consensus evaluation, we recommend agreeing first on the adjectival rating, especially if you are using confidence ratings. If all three evaluators immediately agree on a high confidence rating, for example, well, it took all of five seconds to agree on that rating. If there isn't an immediate agreement, then the team talks and works it out. Then they document the agreed upon rating with a few bullet statements. Remember, rating first and then rationale. We'll talk about documentation next, but for this technique, the first key is to skip individual evaluator reports and to move immediately into consensus after reading a proposal or watching an oral presentation. The second key is to agree on the rating first and then to document bullet statements to support the rating. Here is a great opportunity to save time, streamlining our documentation. What can we do to save paper and reduce rewrites? One thing is to skip individual evaluator reports, which we just talked about. So let's imagine a team meeting in consensus. As they meet in consensus, a note taker can jot down points that the evaluators verbalize and agree on. Or each thought can be put on a sticky note and the sticky note organized on a wall. Maybe a green sticky note are strengths or favorable aspects of a proposal. Yellow could mean marginal and pink means real problems. Can you see that this evaluation team has just completed its evaluation? Imagine if they invite their attorney in and whatever other reviewers there are to review the wall with all the sticky notes. Everyone can agree on the content of the technical evaluation report while the sticky notes are still on the wall and before any text has been put onto paper. Then once everybody is happy, anyone can transcribe the wall into a Word document for the evaluation report with each statement from the sticky note becoming a bullet in the report. And since everyone already agreed on all the content, there will be no weeks and weeks of rewrites for the report. And imagine further that the evaluation team briefs the selection official in this room looking at the wall. Isn't this so much better than making him or her read a long report? So that's one approach you might try. Another approach is to prepare worksheets for the evaluators to use to take notes on. Here's a template that evaluators can use for note taking. This template shows three evaluation factors with adjectival ratings assigned first at the top of the page and then space for bullets to support the ratings above. When the team meets in consensus, they can use this same template to document their consensus evaluation. And let me here answer a common question. Can we document our evaluations with bullets instead of long narrative essay paragraphs? Yes. Nothing in the FAR or its case law requires long narrative essay paragraphs for evaluation or selection reports. Yes, you may use brief bullet statements. Let me prove it to you. Here's a bid protest decision on an acquisition that used brief bullet points in the evaluation report. Please pause and look at the text from this GAO bid protest decision. The four bullets you see at the top are direct quotes from the evaluation report. The evaluation report had 11 brief bullet statements and the unsuccessful offerer protested these four. The protesters said they were unreasonable, too little substance, vague and subjective, and per se inadequate. But what did the GAO say? They said, we disagree. You can read the explanation for yourself, but clearly you can see that the GAO accepted bullet statements and brief statements at that. We simply do not need long narrative essay paragraphs. The GAO has repeatedly said that we don't need exhaustive evaluation and selection documentation. That's right. 
Bullet statements are the right answer for evaluation documentation. This seems so simple, doesn't it? Bullet statements instead of long narrative essay paragraphs. These are most of the techniques that we share in our in-person pill boot camps. Most of these seem so simple and so common sense, and yet we know from our own experience within DHS and also from our interactions with other agencies that our culture of avoiding all risk gets in the way of these common sense practices. We hope you will try some of these techniques on your own acquisitions. You don't need a procurement innovation lab to do these things. Within DHS, we encourage procurement teams to try these techniques, and we are available as coaches if they need us, but we want them to be able to do these on their own. You're right, Trevor. These are simple and common sense. None of these techniques are far deviations or anything of that sort. None of these techniques require agency head approval. The contracting officer, him or herself, can decide to use any of these techniques if his or her culture will allow it. The FAR allows it, and that's what the DHS Procurement Innovation Lab is all about, allowing procurement teams and contracting officers to more fully use the flexibility that the FAR already provides, but that our culture has taken away from us. A key aspect to what we do in the pill is our model of testing and sharing. By testing, we support procurement teams as they use these techniques on real acquisitions. By sharing, we find ways to share those teams' stories. We're telling you our story right now. In this video, maybe something we share here will resonate with you, but maybe not. And even if not, we believe that sharing and professional dialogue are crucial to us as contracting professionals. We need far more professional dialogue. We might not agree on every practice, and that can be okay, but we all benefit from the dialogue. So in light of that professional dialogue, we hope this video has been helpful to you. We all want to make sure that the contracting and procurement professionals use every tool available to us, every flexibility to best accomplish the mission. That means faster and with greater confidence that we've selected the best contractor for the work. Thank you for watching this video. We're glad you've taken the time to watch this presentation about the Procurement Innovation Lab techniques. If you have any questions about the techniques, please submit them to the Federal Acquisition Institute at contact at FAI.gov. Your inquiries will be shared with the DHS PIL team and they'll respond as quickly as they can. The Federal Acquisition Institute thanks our guests, Trevor Wagner and John Inman, and our special guest, Matthew Blum, and of course FAI thanks you, our viewers, for your time and attention.